All right, so today I want to talk to you. Um, we left off with St. Augustine and he's, he's writing, you know, early fifth century, so early 400s. And after the sack of Rome in 476, this is when Europe enters into, depending on your perspective or point of view, if you're a secular humanist, you're probably going to call this the Dark Ages, because there is a lack of innovation, of technology. Things go from like a centralized government of the Roman Empire, where all the roads led to Rome, right, to where after the fall of Rome, the empire breaks up into all these like petty and feudal kingdoms. If, however, you happen to be Roman Catholic, this is not the Dark Ages. This is the Golden Age. This is the Age of Faith. And the Catholic Church, and specifically the Roman Catholic Church in the West, reigns supreme. Now, remember, we did not have a split between in, in Christendom between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism until 1054. So we're still, there's still one body of Christ, different bishops throughout the Roman world, but there is definitely a different mentality from the Latin bishops in the West um, who are looking to Rome for their overheadship, and then the Greek Orthodox, the Greek-speaking church in the East, which look to Constantinople, um, Byzantium, for their headship. And so we have the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope in Rome, but in 476, when Rome is sacked, the Roman Empire is no longer part of the picture because he, now we have Germanic conquerors that are ruling the Italian peninsula. And the Pope, however, elevates his status because now he doesn't have an emperor that he is under in the West, where in the East, you still have the emperor over the Patriarch of Constantinople. So the temporal fall of Rome actually increased the spiritual power of Rome in the West, or of the pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church. So I just want you to be aware of that little bit of history as we head into. And so we're in this period called the Dark Ages or the Age of Faith, depending on your perspective, and a very talented um, Irishman, but once again, historically speaking, in the 8th century, Ireland was Scotland. It was the land of the Scoti. And the Scoti tribes actually invaded Pictland, which is north of England, which is now modern day Scotland. So it became the land of the Scoti. But Ireland was the land of the Scoti. And so we have the Irish and the Scottish as very close cousin people. So John Scotus Erigena, his name literally means John the Scot or John the Scotsman, Scotsman. Be so Scotus means Scott, and so does Erigena. So he was John the Scotsman, but he was probably the premier Greek scholar in the West, this little Irish monk guy, Scottish monk guy, and he was brought into the court of Charles the Bald, one of these Frankish Germanic kings who had set up uh, an empire there in Central Europe in modern day, where modern day France, Germany, and Italy are, or Switzerland. Anyways, Charles the Bald was given a gift by the emperor of Byzantium. And the gift was this book called Dionysius. And Dionysius, if you look in Acts 17, there was a character there on Mars Hill when Paul was denouncing the superstition of the Epicureans and the Stoics and presenting to them the unknown God and after his discourse, some people mocked him, probably Epicureans, but there were certain others amongst them. And one of them's name was Dionysius the Areopagite. And this is supposedly written by that person who was there on Mars Hill. And that was the belief, and it was a gift from the emperor to the king of the Franks, Charles the Bald. And, but because it was written in Greek, they needed it translated into Latin because that was the language in the West. And so they, they got John Scotus to translate the book.
but it had such a profound effect upon him that it influenced his own philosophy and theology. And that we kind of see played out in his book, um, Perfecion, or the divisions of nature. And in this divisions of nature, we end up getting like this hybrid Christian Platonic theology, because it turns out from later research that this was could not have been written by Dionysius in the first century from Mars Hill, but it was probably written around 250, somewhere in Syria, by a Neoplatonist. And so here we have a Neoplatonist philosopher who we talked about in earlier classes, and but it's being written from like a Christian perspective. And then when John Scotus translated it, he took those thoughts contained within, and I would highly recommend reading this book. They do not write books like this anymore. But Dionysius, the Areopagite, if you look for it, it will be called Pseudo Dionysius, meaning false name or fake name. And once again, I don't think it was meant to deceive. It was just like if Dionysius would have written a gospel or his encounter with Jesus or Paul, this is what he would have written. And then John Scotus, being this good Irish Catholic monk, translates this into the Latin and then he builds off of it to his own Christian theology. And I actually got the opportunity to share at the philosophy club. I got my master's in philosophy from San Diego State and they invited me to come in. And I was really pleased because they wanted me to talk on pseudo Dionysius. And so this is a little lecture I gave for them. I wish I had a whiteboard for the drawings but just try to follow along with me here. Can you guys see the document? Okay, so this was just like a little overview because he's not widely taught. He's kind of skipped over from the big guns like Augustine to Aquinas. But when I first learned about this guy, I fell absolutely in love with him. And he may be my all time favorite philosopher, maybe even more so than Plato. But basically what we have is a Neoplatonic Christian hybrid, John combined the hierarchies and emanations of Neoplatonism, because remember, in Neoplatonism, you don't have a creator and a creation, but you have God like emanating out like a fountain flowing. The closer you are to that source of light and life, the more being you have, the more reality you have, and the further you move away from the center or the source, the colder, darker, light, more lifeless you become. So he tried to synthesize the truth given by authority, and by that he meant revelation, like the church. And remember, at this time period, the church is above the scriptures. It's not like the Protestant Reformation where you're judging the church by the scriptures, but it is the church saying what is the scriptures and how to interpret them. So we have the church, the church fathers, and the scriptures, and those are coupled with human reason is where this philosophy comes from. So John Scotus is living in the ninth century, 810 to 877 AD. He was an Irishman, although I already told you that it was actually Scotland at the time. In the mid ninth century, John went to France and became part of the palace school under the patronage of Charles the Bald. When Charles received a copy of the Greek text Dionysius, he asked John to translate it. And I go over there, John, you can look in Acts 1734 if you wanna see where Dionysius makes his appearance. Anyways, it turns out this was probably written, oh, this is the fifth century, in Syria by a Neoplatonic rather than a Christian author. All right. He what also is an aerial pegite? That is a really good question. I think it probably has to do with a location. But if someone wants to Google that, I would be curious to know too. But I think it probably it might have to do with like the location of that hill in Athens is my guess, kind of like a place name. Right. And remember Dionysius is the pagan Greek God of wine, women and song. He's like the party God. So here's this early Christian guy 
named after a Greek god, but then converts to Christianity. Although apparently it was not written by him, but that's that's okay. So in his book, The Divisions of Nature, he joins the notion of natura, which is borrowed by, from the philosopher Bothius. So think of like nature with the theological concept of creation. So the coupling of these two concepts, he believed, would enable interpretation of all truth. In this, he is strongly influenced by Dionysius, so much so as to constitute the first Christian Neoplatonic system. Now, I don't know about that because Augustine had a pretty strong Christian Neoplatonic system. But paradoxically, his thought brings us back to the present because some of his intuitions impregnated as they are with idealism that comes from Plato and nominalism, that was the medieval teaching that the reality was in the name. The reality is in the name, nominalism. These were taken up by Hegel and laters, and we'll, those are further down the highway, and we'll get to them after the medieval period. But this is what I want you to take away from Dionysius, and man, I wish I could draw this for you, but I'll try to do it with my hands. So he divided all of reality or all of nature into four parts. The first part is nature which creates and is not created. And this is what he means by God. So God is not created, but he is a creator. That is the first and rung of reality. The next rung is nature which creates and is created. So this would be the primordial first causes like the platonic ideals or the platonic forms, these ideas in our head of the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's what he's talking about. I included the logos here, but here's where you have to be careful lest you slip into heresy. Because if the logos is not in part one with that which is not created, it makes the logos or the word incarnate a created being. And that is the heresy of Arianism where the Logos is not co-equal or co-eternal with the Father. And that is not what Dionysius meant. But this is the tricky part about trying to combine Neoplatonic emanations with a theistic creation, creator creation. The third part is nature which does not create and is created. And this would include all things animate and inanimate including us humans would be things that are created but we do not create now we can recombine things into different forms and shapes but we do not have the ability to create certainly we can't create from nothing and then finally the last movement is nature which does not create and is not created and this represents creation and its ultimate transformation, but also the mystery of evil. It is not created by God and is capable only of destruction. What's so interesting though, is nature which does not create and is not created is also, uh, is also John Scotus's definition for God. So numbers one and numbers four are both God. And I'm going to stop sharing just a minute so I can draw in the air with my hands. So if we're doing that platonic hierarchy, okay, and like I, I drew for you before. So on top, we have God. He's not created, but creates. This is an eternal being. He didn't come from anywhere. He's not going anywhere. This is like the totality of reality. But then emanating or radiating out from that is this next rung of creation. And this is like, like the creative principles or the ideals in the mind of God in platonic terms, like the ideal forms, or maybe like the personification of wisdom, like we see in, in the Psalms and the Proverbs, where God uses wisdom to create the world. So it is a created thing by God, but in turn, God uses it to create the physical material world. 
And so we have God, we have these emanations of like platonic forms, and then we have the physical material world, including humans, plants, animals, minerals, all these things. And we are created things, but we, even though we can procreate or regenerate, at least organic things can, we are not creating something from nothing. And then, of course, when we get down to the non-organic world with like rocks and water and chemicals, those aren't replicating at all like you have an organic life. And then when you get to the rung before that, remember the Neoplatonic chart? We had God, the Demiurge, spirits, humans, animals, plants, minerals, non-being. Well, that number four in John Scotus is non-being. So we go from pure being, created being that creates, created being that does not create down to that which is not created and does not create, non-being. But non-being and pure being are, are synonyms. So the beginning is the end, the alpha and the omega. And so now what we have, and Carlos, I wish he was here because he kind of anticipated this when we were talking about Plotinus. And that end is the beginning. And so it makes like this cosmic loop, like a torus shape. And actually, I'll pull up one for you real quick. Um, or actually, I'll do it at the end so I don't have to deal with the copyright issues on YouTube. But I'll, I'll end this section with a little torus loop for you guys to visualize kind of like what we're talking about. But I am just so madly in love with this, this thought because what that means is there is no God out there, but we are in God. We are part of God's unfolding and manifestation as he pours out and flows into the world and then brings all things back unto himself. And so truly God becomes the beginning and the end, the creator, the destroyer, the alpha and the omega. But everywhere in between is God saturated all the way through. There is no place where God is not. And there is nothing outside or apart from God. It is all contained. But unlike the pantheist who make no distinction between God and nature, John Scotus was very clear that there was a creator and there was a creation. And so that's really important distinction, unlike what you would find in like Hinduism or pantheism. So even though he sees all as one and contained within God, and we are all like different manifestations of the outflow of God, he still understands the distinction between the creator and the creation. And that's very important. All right, I'm going to go back to that article. As will be evident, John Scotus Erigena is capable of expressing, with the few intellectual means available in his own time, a vigorous and almost modern philosophical construct, very full and articulate. He saw the reality of God and of the world united inseparably in one single movement of emanation and return, exodus and redetus, following Neoplatonic philosophy. The created world, therefore, has no constituency except as a theophany. Who can tell me what a theophany is? Isn't it some sort of study of the Bible? No. Theo is, or wait. Study of God, I think. Some sort of study of God. That's theology. This is theophany. I was thinking theo, as in God. Like, I was you got going... the God part. What's the... Funny part. Manifestation of God. There you go. <laughs> it's right there in the sentence. So a theophany is God manifesting himself physically, materially in the created world. And so that could have been like a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud, like when he led the children of Israel through the desert. Those were theophanies. It was God manifesting in some physical form. 
we have a lot of examples of what we would call Christophanies in the Old Testament. And often when it refers to the angel of the Lord, not always, but often many sc biblical scholars think it's like a pre-incarnation appearance of Christ, like the angel that wrestled with Jacob before he could come into the land. Some people think that that was a Christophany, a uh, pre-incarnate appearing of God. But even something like Moses and the burning bush, that would have been like a theophany, God manifesting himself in some physical way in which he's communicating in like a human audible voice to human beings. And what John Scotus is saying is all creation is a theophany. And this is transformative. So it's not just trees and grass and flowers and animals and people and rocks and water. All of these things are God physically manifesting himself in some way in the world. Now, he's not saying the tree, the rock, the animal, the person is God but he's saying it's a way that God is manifesting part of his glory, part of who he is into the physical material world. So now every time I see a wildflower, it's not just a beautiful flower or something. I'm actually like seeing the face of God. And I mean this metaphorically or allegorically, but it's like I'm getting a little glimpse or insight into the creator by looking at his creation, almost like how an artist or a musician puts part of themselves, their personality, their spirit, their creative energies into the works of their hands. That's what he's talking about here. And anything from like a baby's smile to like a seed pod or a seashell, I can see the hand and beauty of God in. And and maybe it's because I'm coming from the same ancestry, the Scots-Irish, that this resonates with me so much. But that's exactly how I see creation. I'm like actually walking through the manifestation of God's own ideas and mind and the words he spoke into the world. The reality of God in himself is in fact unknowable. But creation is one manifestation of him. So what he's saying is this high God, this pure being, it's beyond our human ability to even comprehend. But through the creative physical material world, we have access of a way of knowing about God. We can't know him directly because he's beyond us, but we can learn about him through the works of his hands or the revelation that came through his word like through prophets, through scriptures, through the church. The incarnation of the word, Jesus, masterfully commented on in the homily of the opening of the Gospel of John, is the historical moment when he who is by nature indefinable is personally united with man, who is by contrast subject to limits and definitions. The incarnate word testified to in the Gospel of John is the ultimate manifestation of God, of his full and complete revelation, its highest theophany. And so, yeah, a wildflower might be a theophany or a pillar of cloud or a burning bush, but there ain't no theophany like Jesus, God in the flesh. That is the ultimate theophany where God has come down. And Jesus came right out and said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you knew the Father, you would have rejoiced to see me. And it's quite a statement made by Jesus and who he's claiming to be. This ontological, and ontology is a fancy philosophic word, and it has to do with the study of being. Like, what does it mean to be? Why is there something rather than nothing? What is the difference between a divine being and a human being or an angelic being and an animal being? Those are ontological questions, theory of being. So this ontological union between the two natures, the divine and the human in Christ, we call that the hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man, not 50-50, fully God, fully man. And 
this constitutes the model, the first cause and the end of all creation. And this is what Jesus is bringing us by the gift of the Holy Spirit, where we too can become God men and God women. And I don't mean this like in a Mormon sense, where like God was once a man and then he evolved to where he's a God today. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is we are fully human. We were created human. We have a human nature. But if we have been crucified with Christ to our Adamic nature, it doesn't mean we stop being human, but we are a new creation in Christ. We have a renewed human nature, but it's not just a human nature. In 1 Corinthians 6, it tells us, and I think in verse 16, 17, it says those who are, those who are in Christ have been knit together with the Holy Spirit where we don't become God or the fourth member of the quadrinity, but the very spirit of God is knit together with our human spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 6, it tells us we become one spirit. Now we're still 100% human, but we are now connected to 100% God in the person of the Holy Spirit. And that is just fantastic. So Christ becomes like the first fruit or the first model of a whole new way of being human not just human and Adam, but we become God men and God women. And this is following the tradition of the desert fathers and Athanasius who said, God became man so that men might become gods, little g gods, not equal with the Trinity, but we are more than human, but we are, we will even become greater than the angels because we partake of that divine nature. And you can find that in 2 Peter 1, 4. We become partakers of the divine nature. Also, 1 John 3, 9 talks about those who are in Christ do not sin, for they cannot sin, for his seed remains in them. And the seed that's being talked about is the very seed of God. Woo! Okay, so... In Acts 17, 28, Paul quotes from their own philosophers or Greek philosophers, for it is in him we live and move and have our being. So that is what I love about this, this model. Everything is contained within God. It's not like God's here and Betty's out here and Bob and Fred and trees. and No, we're all in God. It is in him we live and move and have our being. Nothing exists apart or outside of God. And certain of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Colossians 1, 20. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And so in this Neoplatonic Christian hybrid model, John Scotus finds a way to discuss some of these deep, mysterious passages in Scripture and to give them context within this Neoplatonic philosophy, where we have God as the totality of all. And it also reconciles the problem of Heraclitus's change and everything is in a constant state of flux and Permenidean permanence. Because in the Neoplatonism of John Scotus, we get God who is one. He can't grow or expand. He can't shrink. He can't come in or out of existence. He simply eternally is. So it's that Permenidean permanence where God does not change, but within God, is infinite movement, like the Heraclitean shuffle, where nothing stays the same. Everything is recirculating, recycling, moving, emanating, flowing out, and then back into himself, almost like a recirculating fountain. And the water just keeps coming back up again and again. Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. John's goal was a categorization and understanding of the totality of reality, what he calls nature. 
the first categorical distinction he drew was between things that are and things that are not. And this is quite interesting. So the things that are would be the realm of pure archetypes or platonic forms. Things that are not would be the physically created world. Okay. Which is kind of weird because the top part, number one in that chart I showed you, that which creates but is not created, and then part two, those things that are created and create, those are things that are, but things are not would be the entire physical material world and that which is not created and does not create. So all of a sudden, God finds himself in the category of things that are and things that are not simultaneously. But the way Scotus deals with this is he leaves that Aristotelian either or sort of logic the law of non-contradiction, and he goes for a dialectical synthesis. And so instead of just having something being good or evil, black or white, high or low, male or female, he is looking for a synthesis between the two extremes. And so this is how that works. He also, before I show you that, how he reconciles opposites, he makes a distinction between the way of affirmation via affirmativa or the way of negation via negativa. And you'll find this is really interesting because in the Roman West, they chose the path of via affirmativa, And in the East, they chose the way of apophasis or via negativa. And this is describing God in the negative. So in other words, in the affirmative, we could affirm God is wise, but in the negative, we would say God is not wise. The aff affirmation is true only as a metaphor. Wisdom is a word that gets its meaning from human discourse. We can apply it to God only analogically to give us a hint of his nature. So even in being affirmative, he wants to qualify. When we say God is good, we're speaking in human terms of goodness. But this is why we can also deny that God is good because literally when I say God is good, God is so beyond my understanding of goodness that it's really an inappropriate word to use in describing God. And so the way he reconciles this is he uses what's called the dialectic. And he takes the point, counterpoint, and then tries to find a synthesis between the two. For example, God is wise is the thesis to the antithesis, God is not wise. The reconciling synthesis between the two is that God is supra-wise, thus anticipating Hegel's dialectical triads by almost a thousand years. And he's a German philosopher we'll get to in a few more weeks, but for right now, this is the eighth century, the first major philosopher really since Augustine. I mean, there were some other guys, Bothius and Abelard, Heloise and stuff, but this is really wild. And so we could swap out anything here. So for the thesis, if we wanted to put black and the antithesis was white, the synthesis would be gray. If this thesis is being, the antithesis would be non-being, and the synthesis would be becoming. But in talking about qualities like of God, I could say God is wise, but I could just as equally say God is not wise, because my human understanding of wisdom is not what I'm talking about with God. So to be more clear, if I'm talking about God's wisdom, I might want to qualify it by saying God is supra wise, or God is beyond wisdom. God is beyond goodness. Does this make sense? I just absolutely, absolutely love this. Theology is helpful with its symbolic language and imagery in helping us contemplate God and God's revealed truth. 
but philosophy is necessary to get at those truths in and of themselves. All true religion is philosophy and all true philosophy is religion. No one enters heaven except through philosophy. And that's a quote from John Scotus Erigena. But remember, the true sense of philosophy is philosophia, the love of wisdom. And without the love of wisdom, how can you hope to know truth? And so that's what John Scotus is getting at. And he is going to have a big impact all the way up until Thomas Aquinas in the 12th century. And then Hegel, I never saw Hegel give Dionysi, or I'm sorry, John Scotus credit for this dialectic, but it, it was almost a thousand years before Hegel wrote. And I just think this is what this is what we would call a both and sort of reasoning instead of an either or sort of thinking. And it's typically what we would tend to find in the East in like um, Hinduism or Buddhism or these sorts of things where you're looking for the truth. What Hegel ends up saying is the truth is the whole. But what Dionysius is giving us is showing us that God is the beginning and the end. It is in him we live and move and have our being, and all of us are part of this manifestation of God making himself known to the world and then pouring out his glory into the world and then bringing that glory back into himself. And so that is John Scotus Origena. And I'm going to show you a quick video of a tor torus, T-O-R-U-S, and this is a geometric shape where the outside is the inside and it's in perpetual. And when I try to vision this philosophy in my head, that's what I think of. And just kind of like these cosmic loops. Any questions or comments before I... Okay. I like this guy. 